Welcome to the Arena Decklist Podcast. I'm Jerry Thompson, joined as always by Brian Gottlieb. And we are once again recording live for the folks in our Discord. I, I guess it's not that great. It's not that you know advanced or live for a lot of the folks who get this on the regular because we put this off for a few days. There was no uh, early access event or anything this time around. So we gave ourselves a day or two just to get our feet wet in both standard and historic and bring y'all some updated content. Yeah, I think it's a good idea to delay a little bit and just make sure we we have useful information. And it kind of worked out in multiple ways. It seems like most of the tournaments that were going to happen this weekend aren't happening. So I, I don't think anyone's really behind the eight ball because we're delaying. And I mean, you and I sat together, played for quite a few hours yesterday, and I think we are able to make a much better cast today because we took the time. So hopefully people are okay with us being just a little bit behind schedule. It was kind of disappointing after sitting there and playing for a bunch of hours, other than the uh, fancy thing that we kind of discovered that we will certainly discuss. Uh, most of the things sort of played out how I had expected, and I wasn't playing against a lot of people who were also experimenting with new cards. Uh, that was certainly more true in standard than in, in historic, but it was still kind of awkward to just play against like the same Sultai and like Demir Rogues decks and things like that. It didn't seem like people really wanted to try the new cards or there wasn't anything they were excited about, or maybe they were just waiting to be told what was good. Well, I mean, we've, we've also been out here for the last two weeks being like, yeah, this set isn't going to change anything. And I mean, not just us, a lot of people saying the exact same thing. And I, I don't feel as strongly about that fact as I did previously, but there are very few ways that this set could potentially change. And I don't know. I mean, like there, there's really not too much players could have done yesterday. Uh, I think some things will unfurl as time goes on, but it, it was a little disappointing, a little disappointing to just see the same decks over and over and, oh, it's Sultai Ultimatum again. Oh, it's Rogues again. And it's good for like stress testing the decks. That's kind of what you want. So you know where you stand when you're doing this fancy stuff. But yeah, it kind of played out how we thought. Yeah, it's not the worst thing for me to be playing against the good decks because, like you said, it is stress testing, which is certainly helpful. But for me, I think on day one, I just want more ideas. Yeah. So it would it would be nice if other people were out there brewing, too. But yeah, as far as like stress testing my decks and stuff, I think I got all of that out of the way. Same. Uh, I want to loop back around to something, though, that you touched on really briefly. No early access event this go around. Seemingly for the foreseeable future, no more early access. Canceled. Canceled. Cancel culture strikes again. People were quite upset about it. And I just think it's really easy when we post opinions that you know everyone's going to agree with. And you, you get those nice social media interactions and you feel good. But I think you're required to, when you're going against the trend, own that and and say your part anyway. I think it's good they canceled the early access event. I've hated it basically from the beginning. Uh, and I, I know people were really let down by it. And certainly the delivery of the announcement, really bad. It, it should have been more time, should have been more lead in. And it, it's not fair to people. Like I know people like, yo man, take off work to be able to participate. Th- that's not fair. They deserved more notice than that. But going forward, I'm a big fan of removing the early access. And I, I'm pretty sure you're on the same page. Uh, yes. So... Yeah. I think that, and kind of what we're talking about, I guess, as far as people not really willing to invest into new things quite yet because they don't have a lot of information. Like, that's what the early access event did for people. Yep. And they got to see a bunch of decks relatively early on, got to make informed decisions as far as, like, how many packs they're going to buy, what they're going to spend wild cards on, rather than going out and having to try it themselves. And... I think that I guess it's kind of weird because arena is still probably just making money hand over fist anyway, but I think that you could logically conclude that it would likely cut into wizards profits. I could make an argument both ways and it would honestly be 
speculation. So I'm not going to make either argument. I, I'm just not sure what the, the impact to the bottom line is. The, the one pro of the early access event, something that I hadn't considered because I just kind of like go out and buy everything upon release anyway, it did give people a way to try things without having to invest if they were one of the people who was willing to play within the walled garden. And that's that was my big problem with the system is like, if you were willing to do the steps and there's, there's a lot of things you have to do to participate in early access. I, I did it once and uh, I decided to never do it again. You have to be very clear that you're being provided with a free account by Wizards and all your communications have to be really clear. And there are situations where like people wanted me to guest on their early access stream, but they weren't sure if I was able to and if I had to make the same disclaimers. And it was it was honestly just a bigger headache than it was worth for me. So I stopped participating. I'm just a big fan of unwalling that garden and letting things play out as uh, they did before. And as far as like non-participants getting the information, there's plenty of people still streaming and plenty of people who are in the same boat as you and I, where they're just going to buy all the cards to start with anyway. And you can you can still perceive things. It's just the, the people who lose out were the streamers that were in the program. Now, if you want to do the same thing on day one, you have to spend a bunch of money. And that stinks. I, I am sympathetic to that complaint. But overall, I think this is a step forward for the game in general. So I would assume that the argument against is that it creates more hype because right. you get to see people doing these fancy cool things or whatever. Yep. But that can just happen two days later yep. or a day later or whatever. And I think it's the, the same effect more or less, except if you see something, you can just then immediately go and spend money. Not like, Oh, I have to wait a day. You calm down a little bit. Maybe it's not as exciting. Maybe you realize that, you know, rent is due or whatever, and that you should probably not be spending that money. So I think there are a lot of ways you could look at it where it's just, pretty clearly a thing that I think makes them more money. Yeah. I am receptive to that argument. And ultimately I, I think you have to do what's best for participation. And also th there's a resource cost, like certainly there was administration of the event that had to be taken care of. There were a lot of wizards people involved. There was always a bunch of people in like the early access discord moderating things and making sure the accounts were set up. So it, it's not zero cost and giving like, a day's worth of labor for six or seven employees and not have them. I'm sure it's more than a day's worth. I'm sure it's a lot of work for people very deeply involved with it, yeah. but taking away all that labor is a return to wizards. So I, I, I get their decision. And from my perspective, it works for my needs. I feel like I'm not behind the other content creators who are willing to participate in the early access. So, so that's good. Uh, so I give it a thumbs up. I know that's going to be an unpopular opinion, but got You got to make those unpopular posts too. Get ratioed. <laughs> You're just out here ratioing yourself. That's right. nice. Uh, I, so for the, the creators, I'm sympathetic, especially for folks that you mentioned, like Yo Man, who took the day off work. Like, obviously, that's unacceptable to get that notice two days beforehand. And a lot of people didn't even get the email. They heard it through social media, stuff like that. Like, that right. is yeah, definitely yeah. not cool. Yep. But for the content creators themselves, it's like, well, release day is effectively the early access thing, except, I guess you're taking some folks out of the equation mm -hmm. and I, it would be different if wizards was better at promoting the folks that they had as the, the content creators doing the early access and stuff like that, you know, yeah. but yeah. it's mostly just like, well, you get to stream the set and no one else does. And like, hopefully that'll boost your numbers. And I'm not sure that it boosts their numbers that much more than if they were just streaming on release day, like everyone else. Yeah. Some people said it was their best day. So I, but, I think so. I think it's their best day, but like their next best day is probably just release day, right? Yeah, I, I think that's a good argument. And but but I will say, if you want to check the numbers on Twitch, numbers were way down yesterday as compared to like the early access event. So take away from that what you will. There's a lot of factors that play into that. I wouldn't just pin it all on that one thing, but numbers were down. <laughs> well, one one of the things is like once you take away the early access event, I think that there were people playing. Fewer well, there were fewer people who were streaming, right? Like th those content creators might do like ridiculous, like six, eight, 10 hour streams on, on early access day. And then I don't think I saw a lot of those people doing it on release day. Okay. So you just think the some of the big names aren't there and that's bringing the numbers down possibly. Yeah. I mean, th there were, I think 9,500 people at midnight Eastern, on release day with when you know we started hanging out and i was just like this this number is really low and part of it was that there weren't a lot of big names online yeah 
and you know, I'm not saying that those people like always stream it until midnight on release day or whatever, but it's just like 10,000 people on a day where a brand new set gets released. It impacts two formats. It's like those numbers are very pitiful. Yeah, not great. Uh, we'll have to see, you know, when we get some more data and compare it to next releases and see what the trend looks like. I, I wouldn't take away too much from it, but just a data point to consider as we move forward. Yeah, and then I, for comparison, I guess like an hour or so before we started doing this cast, uh, it was like midday, and I don't remember if it was like 15,000 or 20,000. Like the number was definitely significantly higher, but like Luis was streaming to 3,000 people or something. Mm-hmm. So it's just like, you know, that's, that's just like one of those things where you get like four or five of those people online at the same time. Yeah. And it's like, well, that's another 10,000 people probably. So yeah, I, yeah, there's no question that there's definitely people uh, who are in it for the personality more than the game itself at this point. That's the way Twitch works. So uh, not having their presence matters. Is it? Is that how Twitch works? Absolutely. That's how Twitch works. I've, I've been doing it wrong the whole time. Do I have yes, to develop yes, a personality? Yep. Uh, Sorry. Guess, bad news. Bad news for you. Guess I'm not streaming. Yeah. That's been my that's been my response as well. So good. Yeah, fair. Uh, you just you just got there a, a little bit before I did. Anyway, jump into it. Yeah, let's talk about it. So I wrote two articles this week, one on standard, one on historic. Historic was about a bunch of sweet decks. Standard was about white decks specifically. And then, I don't know, you posted a list that was like Magecraft, Clever, Lumamancer, Leonin Lightscribe, Mavinda. And you had like Shaw, Crash Through, Showdown of the Skulls. And mm-hmm. then I started looking at it and... Uh, Because obviously I wanted to like, you know, include a cleric's deck and a human's deck and a magecraft deck and try and just cover like all the bases, right? So I start looking into this magecraft deck and find Plum the Forbidden, which is a card that I think I read once and then just like, you know, didn't really think about it too much, right? Like you you just, when the last dump of cards gets previewed, you just kind of like skim through them a lot of the time. And this is one of the times where that was a mistake. So this card is 1B Instant. As an additional cost to cast the spell, you may sacrifice one or more creatures. When you do, copy this spell for each creature sacrificed this way. You draw a card and lose one life. So instant uh, obviously works with tokens. thing that you pointed out to me was that like you don't even have to sack anything. This is just like a cantrip at its worst. That's that's so absurd to me. And that's that's what I missed when I fr- like I did put this card on my radar because there, there were two cards in the set that I'm like, these kind of have storm. And as soon as I saw that, I, you know the way my alarm bells work. I, yeah. I get concerned when things kind of have storm. And I, I've definitely focused more on the white card. Uh, t- what is something endurance? Show so of confidence. Get, show of confidence. Yeah, close enough. I, I remember you bringing that card up constantly. I was like, yeah, I get it. Like, this is the only one or whatever, but it's so bad. And it was not the only one. Plum the Forbidden is also like another card. And I don't know. I just, I didn't see you hyping this card as much or whatever. I did, and- I did not. I did not. And and the reason was, one, it didn't click for me that it was an instant for some reason. I don't know why. Just sometimes you you gloss over things. And like, given how powerful the effect is at instant speed, I think I just expected it to be a sorcery, which is a little weird because it defeats the purpose of what this card does in a lot of instances. But your, your brain does autocomplete a lot of the time. Mine does too. I mean, that's kind of how we got into this situation. Right, right. So I, I autocomplete that is step one. The other thing I autocomplete is that the default mode of this card requires me to sacrifice a creature. And it doesn't. And I think that's such a tremendous difference and expands the playability of this card so much that I now believe this to be the best card in Strixhaven. And after a day of playing with it, like I can usually there, there's certainly moments where I get too excited about a card and then I have to step back a little bit. And now I've played with it for a day. And I think I feel more strongly that this is the best card in Strixhaven because not that it's just like the most broadly applicable or the one that fits in the most decks. It's the one that has the most potential to move the needle, to create an actual new archetype that can compete with what already exists. Yeah, I I think that the ceiling is high. And once you get to the point where, you know, you actually read the text on the card and you're like, oh, well, at, at worst case, the floor is this cycles. Yeah. Then the ceiling's very high. The floor is very low. There's obviously a lot of different combinations of things that you can do with it, but the question is finding the right home. Uh, But yeah, regardless, this does something that is very powerful and something that not another card can do, right? So that alone should separate it. So 
Anyway, I started building these Magecraft decks, and I had this in my deck because I had uh, Clarion Spirit and Light Scribe. I, I someone someone said that card is like like and subscribe, and now I can't. I have to like get past <laughs> that to get to the actual name of the card. So I, I'm, I'm going to struggle on that every single time. But yeah, I, I hate that you've told me that now. Yep, yep. I'm I'm sorry, but yeah, I had those cards, and then. I think I showed you that list, and then we talked about, like, Sedgemore Witch a little bit. My deck had Lurus, so it didn't have Sedgemore Witch. And then it was like, well, can we do, like, an actual aristocratsy thing? And then Bastion of Remembrance got brought up, and then you just spent the entire night building decks around this card. Yeah, it snowballed very quickly. And it helped that I was already working on sacrifice stuff. I was looking at Extus decks. Uh, my buddy Connor clued me into that card. And it seemed pretty promising, honestly. And I still may go back to Exus. Extus. Which one is it? Exus? Extus? E X T U S. Okay, Extus. Uh, I still may go back to that and try and combine it with Plum stuff later on. But basically, I already had this whole core of I'm using the lessons to fuel these sacrifice cards very efficiently, very, very efficiently, using either Professor of Symbology or Hunt the Specimens to go grab Pest Summoning from the sideboard means you're investing one card to make three bodies. And that's a really, really big return, even if it's not super mana efficient. But also, the, the pests are good. Like being able to get life opens up a lot of other avenues and it allows you to do the aristocrats thing where you can tread water for a little bit and make these really narrow, finicky decisions to just keep your life total slightly above water and have enough life to convert into cards on the next turn. And it all just snowballs from there. And then obviously at that point, when you're building these decks, you haven't played with it yet. And you're, you're theoretically excited. And then you cast this card for the first time and you, uh, you draw 10 cards in a turn and fireball out your opponent from nowhere. And you're like, oh, the output on this is actually, for once, I'm going to use the term as intended, broken. It can be broken. Like this card does broken things where you're just able to draw 20 cards in a turn. Like you shouldn't be able to do that. But this card allows you to do that when you combine it, especially with Sedgemore, which there's other Magecraft stuff out there where you can just do really, really absurd things with these copies with such little mana investment if you're willing to do the setup. And the fact that you're able to use these learn lesson pieces to do the setup so, so well means you have a real core of a lot of decks present here. You said that the lesson stuff was not mana efficient in that, you know, you're spending five mana to make three pests, but it is mana efficient in that you constantly do have things to do with your mana. Correct. And Good point. The floor of that also is like, well, okay, pests aren't going to do it. Well, then you get to rummage and maybe you have some graveyard stuff, whatever. So I agree with you that, you know, hunt the specimens and the pest summoning. It's like, eh, it doesn't really feel like you've gotten anywhere uh, compared to what, the average standard deck is outputting, but mm -hmm. you know, you, you have accomplished a bunch of things and it basically just means that like, if you are able to incorporate these things into your deck, then you're just going to have stuff to do, you know, like any, any like medium seven card hand is still probably going to be fine. You're going to be able to curve out. Even if you're a little bit flooded, like you're going to be able to rummage through that stuff. You mold a six, whatever. You still know that you're going to be able to curve out like every single game. And you know, that that's worth noting. Yeah. And if you think back to like our concerns around the lesson mechanic, it was consistency based. Uh, if these cards are really powerful, every game plays out the same. And thankfully, these are not very power powerful cards, but they still do the consistency thing. They still allow you to yes. execute your game plan every single time. So something like Plum, it, it now has a double safety valve, right? It has the fact that it just cycles. It's, it's a quasi cantrip, which is awesome but also you're always going to have these pieces around it's it's actually challenging not to have these pieces you, you are so consistent with getting your pest summoning from the sideboard and always being being able to make more fodder and like i've found good lessons too like there's other little good things to do the, the black removal spell is quite good in this context because you do have so much fodder uh you're pretty happy to just exile something and deal with their best thing also we found uh, a really bad bone splinters which you can you can play with all these pests pretty happily because you have again such consistent access you will always have the pests so you can you can just go ahead and bone splinters, even if it's not the best card, uh, and happily have a one mana removal spell, which then plays well with your Sedgemore Witch, and all these efficiencies start to pile up. 
to the point where you actually make something that's more than the sum of its parts, which has been challenging to do in standard for so long because the top ends are so powerful. It's just like, well, I could put together all these finicky things, but I could just cast ultimatum and kill you. Now the finicky things are getting like this quasi combo kill and you can start to believe that this could be a path forward for the format. It's close. I, I don't think that we've gotten there yet, I, but like, obviously we still have a lot of work to do too. Right. Part of the stuff that you brought up with pass summoning into, or hunt the specimens into pass summoning where it's, just, it's, it's so slow, right? And you need yep. to pressure Sultai and you can't really rely on like clocking them or even disrupting them because they have several backup plans. You know, I, most versions are playing like a Seagus Chariot or Elder Gargaroth now. It's not like Necromancer is actually going to get them. They always have Urian waiting with Omen of the Sea. And uh, Binding of the Old Gods has been a, a, a pretty big problem for like trying to set up like Bastion stuff. And mm-hmm. obviously they have a bunch of sweepers and stuff too. So I think you're, you're going to have to do something like very dramatic and very special to be able to stand up to a deck like that. No, I, I think that's fair. That's certainly going to be the pressure point. And like you mentioned, we've tried necromentia nobody loves that card but like card you sucks. play it you play it because you think you have to there's there's other disruptive elements out there w- one of the best things and uh, if you had to put me on like what is the best plum shell i, I would say golgari in terms of maximizing plum but the problem is you may need access to other things vortex comes to mind is it sulfuric vortex or is that the old card that's the magmatic old magmatic vortex right Nope. Roiling Vortex. Oh, my God. The, the other the red word. I'm sorry, man. Uh, yeah, we tried. Uh, Roiling Vortex has, has been a good way to get on the deck. You also get some more pressure if you're in red. I know you particularly have been invested in the red side of things. And I also dabbled in a little bit of Learn Phoenix, which is a card that I am growing in appreciation for. I think it's actually quite good also in that scenario you do have access to like claim the firstborn which is a very real card when you're sacrificing things all the time so uh i don't know what the final shell of this is going to be whether you're just supposed to combo and maximize plum as hard as possible and glue together the problems you have against the big decks with some weird sideboard cards or go a little bit more towards a mid ranges approach where you're playing generically good cards like Claim the Firstborn and using that to push your advantage a little bit. I, I think they all bear exploration. Yeah, I I like Retriever Phoenix. It was basically like the last card I cut from my list of things that I wanted to talk about last week when we talked about our 20 cards or whatever. And it reads kind of okay. And then you kind of think about it and you realize that you can only return one. Mm -hmm. That is a letdown. It's a huge letdown. And then it's like, oh, okay, well maybe this is kind of bad or whatever, but then you actually play with it and it's, it's stronger than that, I think. So I was, I was actually pleasantly surprised with how it played and now it's just about finding the best home for it. And I've, I've seen, you know, some builds that go very hard on lessons and stuff. And then the stuff that I was messing with was like hunt the specimens, eye twitch, and then eventually started playing some of the burn spell igneous ignition or something like that. Something like that. One of the red words. Yeah. And I have started down a path that I think is good. And like you watch me play some of these games, right? Where I'm mostly just spinning my wheels and, and not doing a whole lot, but between the Phoenixes and, you know, eye twitches getting in there and pests getting in there. It's like chip damage. Yeah. Chip damage. You can get them kind of low. And then there were just situations where I'm like, all right, I'm digging to my last three point burn spell or whatever. So I think that if you configure the deck to have a little bit more reach, then you could probably beat up on Sultai pretty badly because they don't have a lot of life gain. Like there's, there's elder Gargaroth, right? And they cast, the ultimatum and it will usually soft lock the game, but it still takes them like two turns to win. And it, it soft locks in where it's like, well, here's this big ground thing and it's going to tap down your team and whatever. But this deck doesn't really care about that stuff. You know, like you're still usually at 20 or something and you have a few turns to actually get in those last few points and even stuff like flyers, like the, the Phoenixes, you know, they can't really stop them. So I think that this is actually a good plan and they haven't had to, to deal with that stuff. You know, right. the, the red decks aren't damage based, right? Or they're not like reach based. It's all about like creatures and actually connecting and combat and stuff. And their plan locks it up against decks like that. But when, you know, they're at eight and their life total is not safe, well, you know, then they have some problems. So 
I actually, I actually like this plan. I'm excited to keep working on it. Yeah. It, it seems like it has promise. Uh, I, I think in the same way, like that's the appeal of going hard combo is the reach you get from d- doing bastion stuff means you don't actually have to participate in combat. And I have, I have beaten the ultimatum decks post post ultimatum. Like you're just able to configure your deck in such a way that you're gaining more life and you're finding ways to extend the game. And that is really, really promising. It, it, it's not solved. I don't want to sell it to people like we have cracked this format, but it is promising where we thought nothing would be promising. So of course we're excited about it when you show us a way for there to be some new potential for the format. I I am so excited to work on a tier 1.5 deck. I'm stoked. Yeah, I I get it. I get it. (laughs) Like the polls were really defined coming into this new set release. You had really good aggro decks, really good big decks. And then there was the the middle was pretty well occupied as well. So it just didn't seem like there was a lot of space for anything. So finding it really exciting. So back on Plum, I just want to touch on this for a little bit, is Standard is very limited in the stuff that you can do with this. And the fact that this is a a two-mana card with a very high ceiling, it it may be briefly, just very briefly, I haven't actually looked into this stuff, think about older formats, right? And one of the cards I thought about was Genesis Chamber. So there are potentially some some awesome things that you could do with this card in Modern as well. I am curious whether it pushes in that direction I, there there's no way to make a safe st- storm card that's what i that's what i feel on the mechanic if you let your spells copy themselves things can go wrong and sometimes you have to work a little harder but ground rift was all the proof i need if you, that card can be real then a lot of cards can be real yeah dude ground rift make it a comeback yeah doing some stuff over in modern right now love to see it alongside our buddy niv magus elemental yeah well it's it's your buddy it's not my friend uh, it betrayed you pretty hard. I understand the reluctance. Dude, five and five. I went five and five with that deck, which was one Impressive, of my better. actually. <laughs> one of my better Pro Tour records, too. Nice. Anyway, back to standard. One of the cards that we did talk about last week was Sedgemore Witch, and I was apprehensive about it, and I'm still apprehensive. But I feel like you're you're just kind of like all about this card. Like it. I guess when you're doing Bastion stuff, it makes sense to play this card, but it's been in and out of my Rakdos decks, and I think the final version is probably not going to have it. So, like, where where do you fall on this card now? I It depends what you're trying to accomplish, and th- there's some setups where this is the best thing you can be accomplishing, and if it survives, you feel like you're just going to win the game on the spot. Uh, really hard focus on the sacrifice plan and the combo kills. Uh, you know, basically you sacrifice a bunch of stuff with Sedgemore, which in play, draw five or six cards and get all six tokens back, get six cards deeper, find your second sacrifice outlet, and you just fireball your opponent out from ridiculous life totals with very little mana investment. Now, this requires Sedgemore, which staying alive, which is tough. It's a very fragile creature, but we're talking about chip damage. This does that thing. And if it survives, it's also attacking really efficiently too. Like it having menaces is not irrelevant. That has come up for me a bunch. So it does a really good job of putting your opponent into those vulnerable ranges. And I think that's the area I really have to explore more. And I just saw, I'm keeping like half an eye over in our live chat section. Teji mentioned weaponize the monsters which is actually not a card i've thought about all that much mana intensive it's mana intensive but where you kind of have this surplus of pests and chip damage this could be a really strong way to just close out games from safe life totals and do the thing where your opponent thinks they have safety and from nowhere you're able to deplete their life total over two or three turns so i'm interested in exploring that if you still have a board yes but the salt decks have a bunch of sweepers and and stuff like that so like i don't know you were you were talking about like oh, i've beaten them post ultimatum and like yeah i have too but it's normally like the ultimatum and make it so i don't have a board and then i have to put things Rebuild. together yeah so if they're ultimatuming and you still get to keep like bastion and like some creatures or whatever like yeah they're in trouble like they they have definitely misread the situation but that that was not my experience like they they were very keenly trying to like break me down first before they would try and alt and kill me. So monsters, uh, maybe it, it, like from the games that I've played so far, it has seemed like my mana is normally spent like digging and trying to find ways to actually deal the chip damage from like no board versus mm. like, Oh, I have 10 pests always. So whatever, like if you're, if you're doing Sedgemore witch stuff, it's more likely for sure. Right. 
one of the things that's just interesting to me is how easy it is to anticipate their sweeper and turn it into like five cards for you, which is, it, it means it's more about time than actual resources. It's tough to run out of resources, which is why yes. I can, I can believe the idea of weaponize. If you're just patient and you always hold up that two mana and you know, no matter what you do, I'm converting this into five or six cards. So go ahead and wrath will rebuild from there because it really makes their window short. And if you're able to do that, get some chip damage on top of it. I, I like the ability of weaponize to close the game, but you, you have to build around it. All these things, the deck building decisions that come from this card. And that's another reason why I think I went so deep into it is that they're interesting. They're they're all connected decisions, and you have to be really cognizant of what your game plan is, how you're actually approaching matchups. It's not just about, oh, this card is good with this card, so I'll play this card. You have to know what your goals are in every single game. Yeah, and I, I missed that during this preview season. There wasn't really a thing that jumped out to me, and I immediately built five decks with it, you know? Uh, yeah. Jadzi did that a little bit, but I was certainly more skeptical of skeptical the mana card yeah, than yeah. the two mana card. Uh, but yeah, this one is like, oh, okay, yeah, you can see the upside. I actually want to build around it. It feels good, man. So yeah, it really does. I, I was I was definitely very happy the last few days, and I, I still have work to do, right? So like, I, I'm still in that mindset where I'm enjoying myself, so that's good. Yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm sure we could just make this a plum cast. We could talk nonstop about what we're doing with plum, but there, there is other stuff we should probably touch on, right? And, and we have experimented with some other things. Yes, the main conclusion I came to playing this and a bunch of other decks was that Sultai is definitely the litmus test. Like that is the thing that you have to be able to beat, maybe not consistently, you know, but just like try, try your best, get to like a, a 40% win rate, you know, maybe you'll be okay. But yeah, it's just this, the seven mana card that they accelerate into and it usually just wins the game. And that is a very bad thing to be looming over standard. It is. It is. Uh, there, there's always going to be a poll. And, you know, if, if it wasn't this, it might be Ugin. But I, I think that's better. Like, I, I'd, yes. although people people hate Ugin, I, I underestimated how much people hate losing that losing to that card. I would rather it be Ugin than Ultimatum 100 percent. But uh, I don't think most people feel that way. Love Ugin. I'm with you. I'm an Ugin apologist. But yeah. Like I said, I'm getting there with the Rakdos deck. I'll, I'll have something in the next few days, I hope. But in the meantime, Sultai sucks at the end. Yeah. So similar, similarly to these Aristocrats decks, uh, messed around with some other Magecraft decks with Mavinda, eventually settled on Selesnya, and you played some games with that. And you like from, from watching you and, and the matches that you played and – my experience with decks like that is just like pretty hard to gain traction in this format. Like decks don't have a ton of removal, but they have enough to pick apart the key pieces, yeah. which makes trying to do things like that, like pretty difficult. And obviously bone crusher giant is a big part of that, but I don't know, just spot removal spell into sweeper. And then if you had infinite time, you could bastion plumb them or whatever, or set up with your magecraft stuff and kill them that way. But then ultimate is looming. So it was a pretty big issue and it made me feel like, you know, trying to do grindy stuff with like Mavinda was probably not where it's at. And maybe you just need to focus on killing them. Yeah. And that's ultimately where we ended up. I would say, I mean, it, it's kind of like splitting the difference. What we looked at was like, well, what cards are good with Mavinda? And we happened to come across an opponent on arena ladder who was playing something that sparked our interest and we thought they did a really good job of maximizing the the green spells one of the really interesting ones is primal might so you're able to just win the creature mirrors with mavinda and primal might and that works really well and it plays super well with all your magecraft cards uh we have like and subscribe and we also <laughs> have uh lumamancer so those cards get really powerful with primal might and it's another cheap spell for your deck and it all it all worked really well and you had games that were impressive uh, 2010 magic yeah yeah that's that's how i would sum it up 2010 magic there's cool stuff to be done there's there's a lot of nice cards with mavinda if you go a little deeper uh we found that like 
the, the card whose name I'm never going to remember. I would be amazed if you knew it. There's, there's no way you know the name of the card. It like phases out your whole team and for four mana and they can come back. A- end of the semester, end the semester or something. Oh, that, like that. that might actually be it. That sounds correct to me. Yeah. So you get protection against Wrath and post-board games that you can actually recur with Mavinda because it works on both turns. So that was a cool find and gave me a little bit of hope for playing against things like Sultai. But it's still not exactly where I want to be. Like we played the games. I said the deck was pretty impressive and I can't think of any circumstance where I would actually register in it in a tournament. It just doesn't make sense to me. If ultimatum goes away, then maybe. I, I still think like you're asking for a lot of things to go right. And you should well, probably just like put your white creatures together and let that be your, yeah, your baseline. I, I would just anticipate that, you know, the format becomes more about creature decks and then you get to capitalize on Mavinda plus Primal Might. And that actually matters a lot more versus, you know, you just playing against rogues and them picking you apart and all your cards not doing anything, right? Yeah. 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 The, the, the clock is decent. Like you can you can definitely win turn four, turn five, which which is nice, but uh, it's not consistent enough that I would look to do that over something like just mono white, which does consistently kill you in those windows. Well, let's talk about Blade Historian. Yeah, what's been your experience with this card? There's there's a bunch of homes for it, I think. And the problem is it's when I was building around this card, I felt like I was pushing to get up against well explored territory. So you really need a reason for Blade Historian to replace either the top end in white, you know, be it the equipment stuff or whatever you want to do, or really faceless haven. That's that's what you're giving up by playing Blade Historian in most of these instances. Also, like Red already has Tor Brand, so does it really do anything there? And then Winota is a deck that just like isn't good. Uh, I can't tell you why. Like you put it together and you're like, yeah, these cards all fit. And then you play it and you're like, yeah, this this wasn't very good. And I I had no chance in any of these games. So where are you excited about Blade Historian? Or is it more just like a footnote that you think deserves exploration, but you don't expect to pan out? Historian definitely competes with Faceless Haven. That was the main tension that I kept running up against. And I think in most instances, like if you're just doing traditional mono white aggro type of stuff, Faceless Haven is going to be much better for you because you you play like a small ball game a lot better. You don't necessarily have to build like this big, impressive battlefield. And that deck is usually just like, well, I want to protect like a creature with a mall on it just long enough to kill you. Mm-hmm. And Faceless Haven, you know, living through a sweeper, getting in the last four or eight points of damage or whatever, that matters a lot more than just like, oh, my creatures have double strike for like a turn or two. But with Heliod, I think it's it's really good. And I guess the problem with that is that there aren't a ton of cards that work well with Heliod. Like there are some one drops that have lifelink and you can pump them with Luminarch Aspirins and there's Daxos, but it's, it's like half your deck, right? So like half yeah. the time, maybe your Heliod's doing something. Half the time you have like season hallow blade and elite spellbinder and you just wish that your heliod was anything else but like certainly when you get to do heliod blade historian stuff it feels really good it feels really powerful it, it feels powerful i think the problem is that everything except the like nut draw of heliod into blade historian attack for 10 everything else feels like it's pushing you towards the middle when this deck just doesn't want to be anywhere near the middle. It's supposed to be as polarized as possible, as aggressive and linear as possible. And this is letting you play like more games with your life totals and affect your sizing so you're able to attack through big bodies. But that doesn't matter. It's not important in present standard. So it's kind of like the same problem as Mavinda in a lot of ways where this deck is doing really good things, but they're really good things that you just don't care about in the broader context of what's happening in the format. Yeah, it was like, oh, I'm, I'm gaining life. I have some new clerics in my deck. Granted, they all have one toughness or whatever. But I was like, oh, Righteous Valkyrie and Blade Historian. I'll just build like the biggest battlefield and just be able to beat up on all these creature decks. And it just it doesn't play out that way. And then, uh, again, against things like Ultimatum, you just run into the problems where you're like just a little bit too slow and maybe a little bit too weak uh, against spot removal and you don't have the closing power of Faceless Haven. So Blade Historian for Mono White sort of setups like unless you think that you're supposed to be like a a bigger white deck for some reason i i would not bother i would mostly just stick with faceless haven in winota it's definitely very good and i would want to play some games with spellbinder like using that as a way to try and protect winota before you actually rule it out 
Yeah, so I've been doing that. Uh, we, we can get to why in just a little bit. It's it, it's fine. It makes sense uh, from a theoretical perspective, but it's so hard to get the payoff on Winota, and the payoff is just not what it was. Like you, you need to have a broken payoff, and Blade Historian is close. It's really close, and it's castable. So I thought those two points in conjunction with each other would would be enough to sell me on it. I thought it would move the needle. Thus far, it hasn't impressed me, and I, I can't really point to why. It's just like it's one of those decks that if everything goes right, you do something that's as powerful as what like the mono white, mono red decks are doing by default, and that it, it gets rolled out because of those reasons. So, is it uh, like not drawing Winota issue? Is it a yep. yeah. your your creatures you know can't really attack or block until Winota comes down? Like, what are what are all the issues going on? And I, I I think those are the two main ones. I think you nailed it right off the bat. It, if you don't draw Winota, you're just like playing worse versions of other cards that you know you you could otherwise be playing the more efficient versions because you have to diversify your types or have payoffs for your eventual search with Winota uh and then your your creatures are just bad like playing the downgraded creatures is is not a good place to be and uh, maybe that's just like that's the lesson is you just build the white deck to play all the same stuff and then like slot Winota in there and that gets you closer to where you want to be. And you don't worry as much about maximizing Winota or protecting Winota. You just let it be a part of your draws naturally. That kind of approach appeals to me a little bit. So you have fewer of like the selfless saviors or fewer of whatever two drop you're using to enable Winota and just play the good two drop. I think if you look into that, that's interesting. I did some like hybridization of Heliod Winota that I haven't played with, but again, like <laughs> that sounds like taking like two bad things and you're just like this this has got to be good. And it's like yeah. oh, no, Brian. That is that is the the wishfulness of the situation where you now have two game plans that like again, don't line up all that well against anything. So, uh yeah, I, I don't know what the path is forward for Winota. I think it's just like begging for a human that totally changes things and until it gets that i'm not sure it can actually get itself into the top tier of the format so we were hanging out brian's building his winota deck and he's going through trying to build a sideboard and i'm just like dude what are you doing what are you doing brian you don't need a sideboard this is your your best of one pooping deck and you were spot on and i was able to maximize my pooping equity by also playing lessons in my sideboard and getting seven sweet lessons to go grab with my professor of symbology which i was mostly using just to make an an inkling token in the in the main version of the deck which i think is a good two drop for the deck like kind of does some of the same pest summoning stuff where you get two cards out of one even if you're doing it at a reduced rate but well, I think it's nice because you get to go non-human, non-human from one card. So you get to curve out. And then if you have Winota, like maybe maybe some good stuff happens, right? Right. Yeah, more nut draws. The other thing, too, is like s- s- rummaging is a big deal. We're talking about how the deck just doesn't really function if it doesn't have Winota. So getting a card deeper can also be a really good place and, and something good to get from your two drops. So that was the theory behind playing Professor of Symbology. But uh, ultimately... Yeah, I, I think it's just going to remain a pooping deck, and, and that's as far as it's going to go. All right. Well, if you play against Brian on ladder and he's playing Winota, you know, know it's not because he's just sitting in front of his computer. <laughs> he could be doing Grinding anything in the Winota world games. right now. Right. He's playing Winota. No. Yeah, there's a reason for that. Anything else that, I don't know, jumps out to you or seems like it has promise or just anything, man? Give me anything. Uh, I played a game against Gala's S. Galazeth Prismari and they played a lot of like magnum opus stuff and it looked kind of good. I don't know that it does anything better than it was. It was just straight blue, red, blue, red dragons, essentially uh, with frostbite and bone crusher giant and just like good, efficient blue, red spells going into magnum opus, really using both the treasure to go ahead and accelerate out gold span dragon and then have a payoff for gold span dragon on the top end. And it looked good. I, I was interested, but I don't know that it moves the needle for me. I, I, you know, if we're talking about playing against ultimatum all the time, some blue deck that can beat down is appealing. The problem is you do have the team or adventures lists out there. So this has to do something better than that. And I don't know what that is right now. Were they playing expressive iteration? I didn't see an expressive iteration. What about Prismari command? 
yes, on Prismari command. And that, that was kind of the thing that drew me to it is that they had multiple ways of getting, they had Magnum Opus, they had Prismari command. So they were really consistently generating treasures to both ramp to Magnum Opus and, or Magma Opus, is that what it is? Yeah. Uh, Magma Opus and also the more explosive dragon side of things. So it looked good. I, I only played against it once. It was a pretty straightforward game where I didn't do all that much. I think I was actually playing Winota, if I recall. <laughs> um, but it, it it was fine. It was completely fine. And I, I want to at least build it. But I'm not in a rush to. And that's going to cost me a lot of Mythic wildcards. So I'm going to hold a little bit on that one. Smart. My wildcard stash got completely obliterated. Yeah, well, Historic will do that to you because there's, there's a lot more Mythics and Rares in this set than we're used to. Oh, my God. Looting and Brainstorm are both rare. Yep, gotcha. And just all the cards in the set that are good are rares. And yep. Yeah. yep, 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 yep. I had, I had 400% on my Vault, Brian. Now I'm broke again. That's wild. You were so disciplined, too, saving up your Vault for this precise moment. <laughs> but. I wanted to see how high of a number I could get. Yeah, 400 is good. I, I've seen pictures of people who have like 9,000% because they just never open it and yeah. only play limited, but... Yep. Yeah, same. But I, I'm not that person, you know, so... Right, right. Uh, Historic was fun. Got to watch me play a little bit of that. I messed around with, uh, you know, there's like the Unburial Rites, Scholar, the Lost Trove, Rise of the Dark Realms type of stuff. Now that gets Emergent Ultimatum and you have a bunch of bunch of fancy piles with that. I spliced Mizzix Mastery into this deck. Now it's just a Jeskai deck. Luis has been streaming a, a deck that's very similar, maybe like 10 or 20 cards off. And that deck, that deck was nice. I, kind, I, I, I kind say of was, broken. I say was like, it's not nice anymore. It is, it is and continues to be nice. Well, so that brings us to an interesting point. Uh, I, I agree with you. It looked really nice. It was really good at, doing its goal, uh, winning a lot of games on turn four. Basically, if left unchecked, it will win every game on turn four. It's just got so many cantrips, so consistent, and just does its thing over and over and over. And that is really appealing to me. I I, I like that approach. And then I saw you play against like decks that were designed to exploit you seemingly they were just filled <laughs> with counter spells and you you just kind of took your time danced around them and you had so much redundancy that you were able to combo anyway so that's really promising what what i think is ultimately going to happen is because these decks are so powerful and the graveyard is such an incredible tool in historic right now is that things are going to slant really hard towards graveyard hate like really, really hard to the point where like all those fair piles that you see that people are trying to put together, be it with Dreadhorde Arcanist or any type of brainstorm aggro deck that you can envision. All of that stuff is should be built around cling to dust at this point. It should have many copies of cling to dust because you have to be able to account for things like Mizzix Mastery, which is a card that absolutely should have never been printed. It's preposterous. It was, but also some people are going to persist on playing things like, is it Phoenix? Don't Phoenix. Like, pl please okay. don't. We'll talk about Phoenix. We'll talk about Phoenix. Okay. It can, it can have its own section. Uh, but, but all of these things are pointing towards a greater focus on graveyard. And when we were talking about facing our, our opponents on the side of the Mizzix mastery combo deck, we were like, well, what is the most problematic card? And actually identified it was cling to dust. Like it's pretty easy to play around permanent sources of graveyard hate, but, in this one instance, cling to dust. It's really the nightmare scenario. So I, I want to see people start upping the numbers on those cards to account for the fact that we are in a faithless looting metagame right now. And if you're not accounting for your graveyard, you're you're in a lot of trouble. Uh, yeah. Similarly, I think like scavenging use is solid because yep. Yep. you get to develop. But you know those, those decks they they side in removal right like I had Prismari command Prismari main deck. command covers a lot yeah I had a braid in the sideboard Luis had the shatter disenchant which is maybe maybe better because it can also hit rest in peace which I didn't really have an out for okay. um well yeah I was I was playing all these things for graft digger's cage and I I don't think that you need to play that many so because it's it doesn't even do anything it's the Mizzix mastery side of things so. I think that you could do some of the the red white card and still keep you know like some of braids or commands just to be instant speed, but yeah, like cling. I, I played against rogues right, and this is the deck that obviously has drawn in the lock. Uh, they had a few other counter spells 
they definitely cast Spell Pierce, Mystical Dispute, and Negate against me. I would have not been shocked if uh, at some point in the future they start playing Memory Lapse because that card is very good and Rogue seems like a very good Memory Lapse deck. So they have a bunch of counter spells, and like you said, I you know just kind of danced around them a little bit, uh, forced a counter spell on their turn with a Prismari command, and was able to like untap with uh, seven mana because of the treasure, be able to pay for Spell Pierce and have Mystical Dispute up and resolve my thing and kill him, and that was sweet. But in the game that I lost, it was like, oh, I have the same kind of setup, and then they just cast Cling, and I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm dead. Yeah. Like yeah, just, you just it. can't do anything. And then from every turn on, they just have Cling open. Yeah, it's, it's the nightmare scenario for these type of decks and one that could hold them back from just taking over the format because they, again, I'm going to use this this word for the second time in this podcast, but actually mean it like it's intended. Broken. broken. They they do one thing and they win the game on the spot. It's it's like, it's not even Splinter Twin because they just need to cast the one spell and don't even need a second thing in play. It's it's almost better than Splinter Twin if left unchecked. So that's, that's a scary scenario to be in. But it uses the graveyard, Brian, sort of. It kind of sort of does if it if it has to. Yeah. So that, that deck is nice. And it's, I don't know, it's it's fun for a, a small minute. It ate up a lot of my wild cards, so rip. But <laughs> it, it is what it is. Maybe it'll be good for, you know, some tournaments at various points. Like, Historic becomes more, like, modern. And people are like, oh, finally drop my graveyard hate or whatever. But... I yeah. doubt I doubt that you'll ever get into a scenario that's truly like that because there are just enough things that Cage is good against that stuff like Cage will always be there and it's like slightly annoying for you. Yeah, Cage, a very important card in the context of Historic, way more than it's ever been in any format. So I agree with that. Yeah, that deck that deck is good. I I don't think it's like a thing that you can do always. So caution before you spend a bunch of wild cards on it like I did. I did it for science and content and being able to provide people actual info so you know that's that's buyer, my price. buyer beware buyer yep. beware exactly uh is it phoenix you <laughs> okay so you get you get looting and brainstorm yeah. amazing and, and all these fancy cards fantastic and you watched me play a bunch of games where i was just like yep phoenix problems 40 cards into my deck i found one phoenix and i was complaining a lot brian yeah i was but i also won a lot yeah, you you did. You did. It often felt like you were winning because your opponents had it, hadn't figured out how they wanted to build their, de- their decks yet. They were just doing very suboptimal things. A lot of times, if they didn't do anything, I mean, is it Phoenix is consistent? It does its thing basically every game, sometimes faster than others, but it, it will eventually go ahead and make some phoenixes and i do think like we figured out some important things about building the deck you you do need to be able to generate some aggression elsewhere and i think sprite dragon is an option i think using crackling drake alongside maximize velocity is an option all these things sound great and i think if you get all of this right you might even get yourself some 50 percent matchups which is Damn. just amazing so exciting i mean that's probably better than most of the decks i play in historic so that sounds great yeah Look, look, it just doesn't have like, given how the games of historic work, you're not favored against anyone. You don't do anything that is problematic for other people to deal with. And that's assuming you function and you just have like, uh, it's not a fail case, but you have a, a slower activation case where you just don't do anything immediately. And watching you play the games, it's like you, all these things worked so beautifully together. You had such good selection engines with Brainstorm, Faithless Looting. It, it felt like Old Phoenix, except better. It, it was better than Old Phoenix decks. My, my finales were very good, too. Like that, right. that was the thing is like some of these games, I wouldn't put a Phoenix onto the battlefield until like turn six. But I was using my mana every turn. I never ran out of gas, which when I watch the Phoenix decks that a lot of people have built for Historic now, it's like, yeah, you kind of spin your wheels and then either you did your thing or you didn't. And my deck just always keeps going, uh, which is which is good. I just have to find a better win condition because there were scenarios where, so like I had Dreadhorde Arcanist because it's a, a sweet card and a good card. And I don't know, I, I, I'm i sort of allergic to Sprite Dragon. I just kind of hate the card in principle, but... I think that it would be very good here, uh, especially after playing the games with this. And to that extent, I think that you can play fewer Crackling Drakes and especially how, how a lot of the games play out, right? So you play a cantrip on turn one, maybe you looting and deposit away Phoenix. Well, in that case, you now have to save your one mana cards for turn three. 
so you can go one, two, three, bring your Phoenix back. If that's the case, Arcanist is like an okay turn two play, but Sprite Dragon is an awesome turn two play. And it lessens the the impact of like you breaking on Phoenix or not finding a second Phoenix or whatever. Whereas Crackling Drake is like, okay, you want to grind me out? Like I, I have some of these Drakes, right? And that's just like such a slower game plan. And there were just so many instances where I, I just couldn't cast out. Like I would have to do other things. I wouldn't be able to invest four mana in this this other thing, uh, especially in a lot of the post board games where you have counter magic and stuff. And if I had a maximized velocity in my deck, which you know I brought up, you seconded, like then maybe that would have been different because I could have just like played it and KO'd them in one turn. But regardless, I think that the the cantrip suite is good for what I have, and I think I just need to play Sprite Dragon, No Arcanist, Shave on Crackling Drake. And yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, you're right. Maybe I get to 50% against some decks. I wish you the best of luck. Uh, I'll probably join you at some point. I mean, look, we all love these style of decks and I get it. I'm, I'm right there with you. It's just, it, it doesn't line up well with what the historic format is about. Maybe that'll change after like 20 bands. But I, I think the problem is that a lot of these support cards are going to be the ones on the chopping block. So well, I don't think as a Phoenix is ever going to get its day. So the, the funny thing is, is that, Phoenix, as it is now with Brainstorm and Looting, does line up against what people were doing before the set. Okay. That's that's the problem, is that everyone else got a bunch of new stuff too. And everyone else is doing busted stuff too. So it, it has the same problem that it had in Modern, where I, I didn't play Phoenix very much in Modern because in game one, you're like, oh, my interaction is removal thing in the ice. I can't really play counter spells or these reactive cards. Yep. And... In modern, you could at least like turn two, bring back two phoenixes, and and lightning bolt them out or whatever. You just can't do that in historic, so it, it has even more of that problem. So, I, th- I think the cards that you have in your sideboard are good. You know, you have gust and a braid and memory lapse and dispute, like all these things that are pretty good at disrupting people, depending on what they're trying to do. But if you're just playing like a slower version of the deck, you're, you're just going to lose game one, and I don't really like that. The, the greatest irony of the games we played yesterday and the decks we were working on and trying to build is that if you wanted Historic to look like a traditional Magic format where it's not just about doing the most degenerate thing possible, taking all the turns, winning one turn with Ultimatum, the card that's missing is Lightning Bolt. Like, these decks need to be able to kill their opponents yeah. and it would allow you to play fair. That's the thing, is like, this would actually benefit the format in terms of not being, like, problematic to play against. It actually makes things less problematic because you're able to instill a clock in these decks. And it, it's so funny that that's where we end up after all of these absurd cards get added and Lightning Bolt does not. That's kind of where we are in, as far as standards is concerned, too, where I talk about Sultai versus Rakdos and the red decks not having this burn component, right? It's like, if, if you stabilize at three, you're probably safe. You're out of bone crusher giant range, right? And that's basically all they have to do. And it just means that you can play these slow games where you play the seven mana card and then win in the next two turns. Uh, we, we just don't have any of that right now. And I, I, I think like, you know, when best of one started and all the burn spells were like pretty good and, and, uh, went face, you know, you had Skewer and Wizards Lightning and all that stuff. It was yeah. like, oh, okay, maybe this is a little bit too far. Let's scale all that back. And then they just took it all away. Yeah, it's it's a big overreaction to what was a moment for Mono Red, I think. That's the way I would I would term it. Yeah, same. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of the same thing in Historic, where if I had Lightning Bolt, I would keep it in against these combo decks. But instead, I have Pillar of Flames and Shocks. And it's like, well, this this is not going to get the job done. You know, like this, this does not add up. I'm going to get them to three or whatever. So now... I have to just disrupt them instead. Right. It's it's kind of like we have to be the crowd that's like looking for the release of the Snyder cut, except we want the release of the lightning bolt cut of Mystical Ar- Archive. Uh, yes, but is, isn't the Snyder cut like really, really long? Maybe we don't want that. Uh, it is really long. And from what I hear, still not very good. My wife tried to watch it and she was just like, it's, it's really interesting because my wife is like very much not online like I am. 
she just is like that's not to say she's like oblivious or not super smart. She is she is certainly very in tune with what's going on. If, if she's not online, I automatically default to she's smarter than I am. It's good good way to look at it. Um, but she also just like when things happen, she doesn't always have the context behind it. And so she just saw a new Justice League movie on HBO, and she's like, "Oh, I I think I'll watch this." And I'm like, "Oh, you're watching the Snyder cut?" I'm like, "Did you watch the first one?" And she's like, "What first one?" And she just didn't know like the the whole story behind what was going on with the movie. And I'm like, "Yeah." this is what happened. This guy was brought in when this happened to this guy and like, like filled her in. She's like, Oh, and I'm like, yeah. So now there's this four hour long version of it. And she's like, this movie's four hours. And she just turned it <laughs> off. Like that was it. She was no longer interested. So I don't know the lore behind it. I just knew that it was a DC movie and I didn't really want to watch it. And that was kind of all the attention I paid to it. Yeah, so I'll give you the the two second breakdown was that uh, I guess Zack Snyder had a family tragedy while he was making the movie, and also like maybe they wanted him removed, and so they brought in Joss Whedon to finish the movie, and it just turns out he's a pretty hellacious scumbag, which is slowly coming to light, and also yep. didn't make a very good movie. Um, so eventually, fans got very vocal and were just like, let let Zack Snyder come back and make his version of the movie did. So they let him come in and gave him like a $75 million budget for reshoots. And then they re-released it and it was still well, not a very good, not a very good movie in the end. So. Okay. So calling it a, a cut implies to me that, I don't know, you just took the same footage that they had, but if they're doing like reshoots and it's kind of like, you know, a, a remastered or a remake of the movie, I don't know how much extra footage they used or had to use or whatever, but well, it's four hours long. So they, they obviously use like some extra footage, like the well, old one wasn't four hours. No, no, no. I know. I'm, I'm saying like new footage versus like cutting room floor footage. Right. 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 Like if, okay. if, if you're injecting a lot more extra new stuff into it, then it's more than just like a cut to me. But I, I think, I don't know. I, I didn't even see the original, so I don't know why I think this. But I think like if it was like, oh, this movie is like remade or whatever, that it would be more appealing to me. But I still wouldn't watch it. Pike is in the chat. He said the, the first one, the first Justice League movie was a five and the second one was a five point five. <laughs> so they really got their return on that. Yo, million. It's like Phoenix. Yeah, kind of. You did, Very a bunch similar. Of, you did a bunch of extra work and got half a point. Yeah. Yeah. It all comes back around to Phoenix. Seventy five million dollars, baby. No big deal. All right, what about time warp? You you have any ideas for time warp decks in historic? Because you're you're a haze of pollen guy to me. Uh, yeah, I'm like I'm I'm okay with doing that. I think you're asking the format to be about some pretty specific things if that's what your goal is. And uh, I question whether this is what I want to be doing when there's the ultimatum stuff, which is very easily achievable. It kind of strikes me as a, a worse version of that. And it also is like somewhat less consistent, I think, because the, the cantrip suite goes a little bit deeper when you're able to use Faithless Looting, whereas these decks are, I mean, they're a Brainstorm deck, which is incredible. Don't get me wrong, but it's like Brainstorm, Tamiyo, Narset, and then you just take all the turns eventually. And that's that's all fine. It I'm sure it works out. I just don't know if it's the best thing you could be doing right now. And I don't really have any reason to find out. Like, uh, I I feel like I found one poll of the format. And I guess, like, this does skip Graveyard Hate for the most part. So that's a decent reason to go ahead and uh, be interested in this instead of the Faithless Looting approaches. If everything starts trending really hard towards, like I said, playing Cling to Dust and other Graveyard Hate pieces, then, then you could talk me into some Time Warp stuff. But uh, yeah, the, the decks I've seen haven't blown me away. I would make some changes to basically every approach I've seen. I don't know that you actually have to be a Haze of Pollen deck. I think I'd try way harder to be like a Memory Lapse disruptive deck and maybe Turbo a little bit more than these decks are doing. Like Something like extremely high land counts uh, for Explore, for Growth Spiral, and then some of the new library of Alexandria land. That's that's interesting no, to me. No, yeah. Dude, that's not turbo. That absolutely is turbo because when you get to the point where you're just like, you've made all your land drops, you're taking all the turn, you just need to keep your train going, right? And like, you don't I, want to do anything in those first few turns anyway. I agree that you want to get your engines up, but like, I mean, Explore Spiral, like, I don't know. I, I'm not sure if they play well with that card or poor with that card. I'm pretty sure they play poorly with that card. Okay. 
I mean, my thought was you maintain a seven card hand size at all time. You're, you always have access to that. And then you just keep, you keep your mana open uh, once, and are able you, to memory lapse. Once you have that card, then I think your explorers and grow spirals become awesome, obviously. But then you're spending like, I don't know, roughly 37 mana a turn to, to put an extra. To do nothing. Card. I yeah. love it. You're speaking my language right now. Maybe we could squeeze in some Castle of Antris and really take this up to the next level. It is. Do you, oh, my God. <laughs> I knew that was the reaction I was going to get. Yeah. Uh, it is funny to me how you go from like, I want to just do the most busted thing to, <laughs> to like doing absolutely nothing. Yeah. Yeah. To doing a thing that is very clearly the opposite of broken. At least you weren't like the biblioplex is, and I don't use this word lightly. Broken. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. I, probably I would just my expectations. The cast, but similarly to Phoenix, I think that these decks are good against the old format. Like this, this would clearly get under Sultai, right? But against the current crop of stuff, I I don't think so. I do think that you have a lot of good pieces. You know, you have a bunch of time walks. You have like Narsitamio, uh, and this is obviously very good. Your mana base is good. Eight Explorers is great. You know, all these things are great, and then it's still just like, well, you're still like a turn and a half too slow. So yeah, there, there's better stuff to do with time walk. I think yeah. Uh, Inquisition of Kozilek, I did not play against very much, which was kind of surprising. But again, I was playing against like old Saltai decks where it's just like, oh, honey, this is this is going to be dead in a week. Yeah, uh, not a lot of advancement yet. But I mean, I will say it seems like the key cards in the format are quite expensive. Fours and fives are what are most relevant. So if you can get some setup pieces, sure, Inquisition's still good. And I, I do think Inquisition is a fine card. I'm not trying to say it's not going to hit. But I, I understand why it hasn't really stormed out of the gate thus far. Well, I think Inquisition is going to complement Thoughtseize more than it is going to replace it. So I, I agree that if you can afford to play for Thoughtseize, you probably should still, especially with the stuff that is, you know, kind of come to light where it's like, oh, this Mystic Mastery thing is the real deal. But Inquisition's still solid. I mean, if you're taking their uh, setup card, their Thrill of Possibilities or whatever, Thrill of Discovery, I guess is the new one, or, you know, Brainstorm, Looting, Explore, whatever, like Inquisition's still really good at doing that stuff. You know, it was, it was always good at taking the enabler, not necessarily the payoff, and you just try and make something go from there. So I think that it is good. Rakdos could still maybe survive, but that's still only because they have thoughts. He's in addition to this. Right. Yep. Makes sense. And finally, we have Mind's Desire. I was in the process of building a Mind's Desire deck. Womp womp. And you were like, oh, you just can't. You can't do it because of the rope. And I'm just like, nope, never mind. I'm off it. I'm not. I'm not trying to mess with that. Yeah, rope doesn't reset while you're resolving Mind's Desire is what I'm being told. Uh, and so it's basically impossible to to win when you're playing Mind's Desire. So we're just waiting on that. Neither of us played it. Neither of us, of us played against it. So I, I don't really have any input for you. And hopefully that gets sorted out sometime soon because I, I want to figure that part of it out. I mean, I'm not excited for it to be good if it is good, but I just don't have an answer for you right now. Paradox, Paradoxical Outcome is the good version of Mind's Desire, by the way. Obviously, I've played, sense. I've played zero games, but it is the good version. Uh, any of the blue red like make treasure stuff nonsense bolus of citadel nonsense weather of the storm probably better than mind's desire in bolus of citadel so you can you can find a spot for this for sure and i was excited to try the paradox deck but if you're telling me that i would have to race against the clock to play 100 spells well i'm i'm not doing that agreed anything else are you going to be playing historic at all yeah, I'll get to, I was just really excited about Standard. I, I'm sure I will get to Historic, and there, there's certainly plenty of things I want to explore there, but I was happy to kind of take a backseat and uh, watch you yesterday while I poked around with Plum decks. Uh, oh. The other thing I guess I would mention in Historic was that your Bant deck... Oh, it, yeah. It, it looked pretty impressive, and it, it's not doing anything revolutionary, but the addition of Time Warp to that deck I, I think is a big deal, and you had some absolutely absurd turns with Nissa in combination with Time Warp and just kind of going off. And it seems really strong in Nissa decks, and I would much rather do that than try and just be Turbo Time Walks. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that it's kind of nice when you're like, oh, I have 
this this machine that just goes infinite and I take all the turns and I was just like, I'll time warp once and then you just die. Yeah, just kill you. <laughs> why, why do I need to do this 10 times? I don't understand. Uh, so that was kind of my experience. But yeah, just like fairly normal Kahira band with a couple memory lapses, a couple time warps, Brainstorm, of course. And it was, it was really good. It was like a good version of Phoenix and the time warp deck where you're good against the old decks, but also like kind of competitive against the new stuff too. Yeah, that seemed promising. And having a good memory lapse deck in the format will be a, a big part of it. And you seem to use memory lapse really well. Uh, you have to do me a favor. People are asking in our live chat now about looking at all these decks. So after we finish recording, your homework is to go into our deck channels and dump all these decks. And I'm going to do the same thing, all the stuff I have in there. I think I'm mostly up to date and I've, uh, I have mine in the standard channel. But you got to do the same thing. Get all those historic decks up okay. over in the Discord. Thank you. Thank you for doing your homework. Oh, wait, I think I just opened Magic Online instead of Arena. No, that's not going to get the job done. You, I, I need Arena. Okay, I, so, I want importable lists clean for our patrons to go ahead, pick up, well, scoop them up, and get right onto the, Arena. The lists aren't on Magic Online anyway. Okay, so like the Magic Online icon, I have them right next to each other on the toolbar, which is probably not very smart. But mm. the Magic Online icon, to me, looks like a newer program, even though the Arena icon is an A. So I don't know why I keep clicking on the Magic Online one when this is clearly an A. I am I am looking for the Magic Online icon on my desktop, and I, I can't find it. I don't know if that means I don't have Magic Online installed presently. But I don't think that's true because I have it on my stream deck. And if I push my stream deck, it just launches it. So it's here somewhere. It's just not on my desktop anymore. And I, I don't know where it went, and I can't comment on the logo. What is, what is your toolbar setup? How many things are on your toolbar? Uh, it's, it's pretty limited. It's, uh, Microsoft word, Google Chrome arena. I, I wasn't uh, trying to out you. You don't have to list all of them. You can have whatever you want on the toolbar. I was just wondering like how many, uh, it's like seven things. Okay. Yeah. Seven things. Do you have a crowded toolbar? No, I have 10. Hmm. Which, I mean, which is kind of crowded to me. That's more than I usually have. But. I, I also have my stream deck, though, which definitely carries the bulk of the things I use all the time. And I, I like just having that, you know, button that I can touch. And then there's the Magic Online deck list for the day. Or I have a shortcut to the Arena deck list account if I want to go look at deck lists there. So uh, that works for me. I like having that tactile experience. So... Elgato, if you're out there, you know, you can you can throw a sponsorship this way anytime. I'll happily show your stream decks. I, I love these things. I'll talk to Frank. Okay. Good All work. Right. I, I got rid of three things. Now I'm down to to eight things. Nice. I'm sure this is very intriguing podcasting, by the way, as we edit our taskbars uh live on the cast. Wait, should I should I just remove Magic on Live from the taskbar? Do you open it that often? I did some time spiral drafts. I did like seven. Okay, that's more than I would have expected. Yeah, I, I like Time Spiral, man. It's it's, it's really set. bad. It's bad. No, it's bad, dude. It's really bad. <laughs> just straight nostalgia for you? Yeah. Yeah, that's valuable. I, someone posted, I think it was Ryan Overturf actually posted about the value of liking bad things. And I, I have to say, I am very much coming around to that in my old age. There's a lot of very stupid things that I just unabashedly love. And I, I think the more you accept that not everything you like has to be good, the happier you'll be in life. Well, I feel like that with a lot of things that I like. It's like, I like this thing, but I'm not going to tell you to like, go watch this show or listen to this band or whatever. And that's my thing. And I know that you won't like it. Yeah, I think that's good. I think that's a really healthy approach. I guess I don't know if if I would say that those things are bad. It's just like I know that I like them. That's all. Uh, I like a lot of things that I would 100% say are bad. And I know authoritatively they're bad. Oh, uh, last heads up for the folks in the Discord. I'm going to post these lists. The sideboard thing is all messed up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so seven card sideboards. Apparently, it's not just that they messed up how they look because they look horrible. It's it's just horrible. But also, it's like breaking tournament functionality as well. And that's the issue that all these tournaments are having today <laughs> where they're just loading in with seven card sideboards in every challenge. Oh, so uh, this feature shit. that... This feature that nobody wants is just completely borking the first day of tournament play for Strixhaven. Oh, shit. Oh, uh, that's so good. It's not great. That tickles me. Okay. So last last thing before we go. Uh, this this sucks. I'm, I'm just going to post these. 
but I'm getting outed here because I'm not going to bother cutting this down to 60 cards. This is a 61 card band deck right here. Wow. Wow. Against all the advice you've given over so many years, you're about do to as 61 I say, cards. Do as I say, not as I do. Cut a random card from this band deck if you want to play it on ladder. Although, if you ask me what to cut, I'm, no matter what you suggest, I'm going to say that you're wrong. So. Okay, good. I like that. All right. I am going to post some decks in the Discord. You can sign us up. That's game. Good luck.